All right, so I spent a lot of time talking about the kind of uh, crux of alternative dispute resolution uh, in the two areas that are, are most frequently utilized to resolve disputes that appear to be otherwise unresolvable. And so we talked about negotiation at length, which is basically party to party uh, between attorneys. And then we talked about mediation, which is essentially doing the same thing using a negotiation, but with the help and facilitation of a hopefully highly trained, very well trained mediator that is committed to the process of mediation. So when we talk about arbitration, this is a whole other animal that uh, is very different from what we've been talking about heretofore because in arbitration now we're actually putting our case and the other side is putting their case in someone else's hands and what we have for all practical purposes is a bench trial but with many, many more benefits uh, than we typically can get from going through the process of a bench trial or litigation. So by its very name and sense, arbitration results in an adjudication. Whereas with negotiation and mediation, we spend a great deal of time, hopefully, admonishing the client that even if the process was compulsory or mandatory, there was nothing mandatory or compulsory about the need to actually resolve the case. So, if at the end of the mediation or the negotiation uh, you could not reach the, your BATNA uh, or the your client just wasn't satisfied with what was, uh, you know, what was being presented, they could walk away from it without any problem at all. There was no issue whatsoever there. Um, but now we have to kind of spend some time re-educating the client and making them understand that if we go through the process of arbitration, that uh, it's, it's a very different animal because it will, in every situation, result in an adjudication of our case, particular case. That's how it works. Um, and probably the most difficult part of arbitration is, is, is realizing again how to best and most timely inform the client so that they understand what their ex expectations should be about this process since it is essentially completely different from everything we've talked about thus far. Uh, so let's talk about the basic, uh, I, I guess we can look at some of the pros and cons to, to arbitration first off. And if it's, if the proposition that it's just like a bench trial, then why do it? What's the point of having uh, arbitration as opposed to a bench trial? Well, the, the main benefits to arbitration are really three. Uh, the first one, and, and you can interchange the first two, but the, the first one we'll say is time. Because whereas a trial, and that's true of a jury trial, and it's also true of a bench trial, Depending on the type of case or dispute that you have, you can be talking about anywhere from one and a half to two years, and if the case is somewhat complicated and complex, you could be looking at three years or more if you go through the standard process of litigation. Uh, with an arbitration, conversely, now you have a situation where because an arbitration probably had uh, a basis in contract and there was probably some established protocols in place, there's probably uh, mechanisms where it allows for a more expedient endpoint or arbitration. So whereas a regular kind of run-of-the-mill litigation dispute may take one and a half to two years, 
with an arbitration, it's possible that you can get to the point of actually arbitrating your dispute in maybe four to six months, maybe seven or eight, but that's still way, way less time uh, than you would in a standard litigation matter. The other benefit is that, uh, again, if, if we talk about emotion and drain in terms of, of the drain in people's time, uh, just having that kind of 800 pound gorilla on your shoulders, that is reduced substantially in terms of time, and so it helps all of those things. But the second thing, as I said, interchangeable as they might be, is money. So if, if we recognize that a standard case that's being litigated, uh, you know, especially if there's a lot of discovery, there may be experts involved, things like that, we can easily be talking about on the defense side a uh, hundred to hundred and fifty thousand dollars in attorney's fees easily uh, and of course the flip side of that is if you're representing the plaintiff depending on the length of time it takes for you to get to a trial jury or bench that's money that you're not making it's it's money coming out of your pocket for expenses and your time but you're not getting paid for that or reimbursed or in any way taken care of throughout that process. So anything we can do to reduce the time frame is going to naturally help you in terms of making more money by getting a case resolved more quickly. So that's a crucial thing to remember if you're a plaintiff. And naturally, if you're on the defense side, if you can resolve a case in six months rather than 18 months or two years, that is going to result in far less fees for the defense or defendant. Uh, the other really substantial thing to keep in mind is judges generally, uh, they're, they're either appointed by other judges, which are probably people they know, maybe friends. Uh, they may have specialized in one area of law for 20, 25 years or less, whatever, uh, and have no expertise or experience in pretty much every other area of law. So you may have a, an attorney that practiced law and did nothing but uh, divorce cases, family law matters. And that's great. But if, if they're appointed as a judge, now you have a case that involves uh, a discrimination matter, uh, maybe involves a uh, you know, whistleblower, who knows what kind of case it is. But whatever it is, that judge may have absolutely zero experience whatsoever in handling a matter like that. So from a substantive standpoint, the judge literally may have no experience whatsoever. Now, that, that can be problematic, obviously, especially if you're going to have a bench trial. Um, while it doesn't mean that you still can't have a trial, a meaningful trial with a judge that may not be very experienced in a certain area, because of course a judge can read the, the relevant case law and get himself or herself up to speed, it's, it's still difficult if that person hasn't had years of experience in a particular substantive area. And in arbitration, you will always have a, uh, a list and availability, a cache of arbitrators who are experts in pretty much every area that you could have a dispute in. So that would be family law, construction law, transactional law, uh, personal injury, medical malpractice. I mean, you name the area of law and you can find an uh, arbitrator with at least five to 10 years, at least of substantive experience. And honestly, most of the time that's going to really provide a better, more meaningful outcome with someone that really understands, because every area of law, which you probably realize, maybe you don't yet, but every area of law has a lot of nuance, a lot of intricacies. And for people that are general practice people that may do one divorce case a year, or every couple of years, or one uh, personal injury case every couple of years, there is so many small areas that they might not be aware of just because they don't do it very often uh, that can make it really difficult uh, if you don't have someone with a particular level of expertise. 
so having an expert in a particular area, huge, huge benefit. In some ways, it, it, you could almost say that these things are really probably on par with each other, um, and, and there's not one paramount over another, but there, there's significant benefits. So if all these things are so phenomenal about arbitration, what's the downside? Uh, well, the downside can be a, a number of things. Um, there's not a lot of downside in terms of, obviously, you're al almost always going to go to an arbitration more quickly for less money. Uh, this is the area where you, you can get into an argument about why arbitration is not a huge benefit. Now, an area that has really just exploded in regards to arbitration is what some people call mandatory ar arbitration in the employment law context. And so what this looks like is, is that you go to the Acme Corporation, you get a job as uh, uh, in sales or in any number of different areas in the company, and you are asked to sign a document that is called a Generally, they're referred to as DRPs, or Dispute Resolution Programs. And what that basically tells you is, is that in consideration for Acme Corporation offering you a job, that that is the, the consideration for this agreement that you are going to sign that says that you understand that you will waive your right to a jury trial in exchange for being able to address any employment related issue in dispute or claim through this dispute resolution program and while there are a variety of different ways a DRP can take shape generally they have uh, a two or three different levels or layers uh, that an employee can work through if he or she has a dispute or claim and the first one is, as you might expect, an informal level. We're going to go through all this in much greater detail, but just to give you an idea of the biggest downside that people will argue about with arbitration. So there's three levels, and the first level is typically uh, an informal process where an employee will speak to a supervisor, maybe someone in HR, if they have a, 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 an issue, and try to resolve it at an on an informal basis. And that, that's kind of standard pretty much almost anywhere you go. If that doesn't work, then the employee files uh, for a second round uh, or the second level or layer, and that's usually a mediation. And the mediation is done in the hopes that the employee and the employer can come together and creatively work through a dispute and uh, so forth. So uh, now if the informal process or level and then the mediation level don't work. The third and final level typically is a mandatory and what we call binding arbitration. And uh, there's a lot of layers to that as far as how that works and there's a lot of hopefully if you prepare one of these you'll, you'll, you'll know how to prepare it in a way that is fair and on a level playing field for the employee. But, uh, it will essentially mandate that if there is an unresolvable through mediation and informal processes uh, dispute, then it will go to the final level, which is binding arbitration, uh, and that's that. And so whatever the arbitration result is, then of course that's it, unless there can be a showing of fraud or, or something like that. But So then the argument against arbitration is, well, if you're an arbitrator, and you are arbitrating for employers. You know that you know when people do their due diligence, they're going to be looking at your background and your track record for cases. And so, if you're if you're ruling frequently in favor of employees in these types of programs, you could see where uh, arbitrators may realize that's probably not 
the best business tool to get more business, right? Um, so that's, that's one uh, negative that, that you can look at. Uh, the other negative, of course, is that there's a level of compulsion when you tell an employee that by you signing this document and accepting a job, is the consideration for you giving up a constitutional right to a trial by jury. Some people have concerns with that. Um, now, of course, the flip side is, is that the employee does not have to take the job. The employee can move on to a different employer, can continue in the, in the job search. Uh, but the, the reality is, is that if you're at the point of actually being hired for a job, in the vast majority of cases, the employee is going to sign, and really doesn't have a choice, they're going to sign the mandatory or binding arbitration agreement or dispute resolution program document in order to get the job. Um, and so, you know, that, that creates issues uh, as far as an argument that, that you know, there's, there's just not, a, there's an unfair advantage, an uneven playing field for employees and, you know, that again, there, there's some studies that have come out, we're going to talk about a little bit later, uh, that, that probably suggest in the end that uh, dispute resolution programs actually work better in the employee's favor, even though that on its face seems like that wouldn't make sense. Uh, but, so we have the, the primary benefits to arbitration and then some of the downsides. Uh, and, and really, as I said, when, when it comes to cons, it really boils down to mostly that it's employer favored. The other reason that there's an argument that it the employer is, is uh, there's a slight or a big advantage sometimes to the employer is that in these binding arbitration scenarios, usually there's a provision that if the employee does not hire an attorney, then the employer will also not hire an attorney. Uh, so sometimes an employee may feel like they're better off not getting an attorney. Uh, not realizing that you know the employer, even if they don't have an attorney actually physically working through the process when the arbitration takes place, the employer still has attorneys usually working for it um, and can do a lot of things that the employee might not realize behind the scenes. So, the, you know, when it comes down to it, the, the major cons that you hear in arbitration are going to be with that. Now, in non-employment employment context, there's always the issue about unfairness for um, consumers, as an example, when you buy a cell phone, almost always when you buy an automobile, uh, if you look on TWIN under the um, arbitration section, I have a, an arbitration agreement that came with a dog toy that I purchased called the Wiggle Waggle something weird name, but it's on there with a video of, of what this is. But it's a plastic ball, it's hard plastic, and you roll it on the floor, and some of you might have already bought this for your dog, but it makes like laughing sounds and crazy sounds, and the dogs go nuts for it. Uh, so, but when I open the box, big, I mean, right before I can even see the toy, there's a piece of paper on the top, I pull it out, it's an arbitration agreement, that basically says, if I don't return this item uh, and notify the manufacturer within so many days, uh, that will constitute my uh, acquiescence or agreement to participate in this mandatory arbitration agreement if there is some dispute that arises from the toy. So, I mean, I don't really have any way to meaningfully negotiate with the manufacturer. I buy the toy and I pull out this piece of paper and it tells me that, you know, if it's essentially an opt-out. If I don't do something proactively, 
then I'm automatically in, and I'm automatically going to have to arbitrate uh, if there's a dispute about this toy. The same is true of your cell phones. I'm sure that none of you, or maybe very few of you, have read your cell phone contract, but in that contract, in tiny font, there's an arbitration agreement, I think probably in every single one. Uh, so if you don't have one, let me know because I'd love to find one that didn't. But it will say that you have agreed to arbitrate any disputes about the phone service or about the, you know, anything involving your plan with AT&T, Verizon, Singular, whatever it is, uh, through this arbitration program. And it will lay out kind of the parameters of that, including choice of law, where the venue is, you, you know, maybe in New York, it may be in L.A., it could be who knows where. So uh, there's, a, there's the idea that in these types of situations where consumers really do not have a genuine, legitimate opportunity to negotiate when we're buying something, there's already an arbitration agreement. And here's the thing, if you're buying a cell phone, and you see that there's a, uh, a little term on the bottom of the page in 8 font that says mandatory arbitration, it's not like you can take a pen, cross that out, initial it, and say to the clerk, I'm good with this, but I want to remove this arbitration agreement because I don't want to give up my right to a jury trial if I have a problem. I mean, a clerk's going to look at you and say, sure. The, the problem is I can't agree to that, and if you don't want the arbitration uh, provision to be part of this, then basically we're just not going to be able to give you a phone, and you'll have to go somewhere else. The problem is if you go somewhere else, you're going to run into the exact same situation. So it's essentially, uh, you know, there's, there's really no ability whatsoever to negotiate. As I said, you buy a dog toy, almost anything that you purchase today, you will find a piece of paper inside of the box or the paper, whatever, that will tell you that there is a mandatory arbitration provision. And it's really amazing how ubiquitous that's become. So those are the just the basic kind of ideas as to the pros and cons of arbitration. Generally speaking, arbitration is phenomenal if you have a dispute that otherwise cannot be resolved and you want to save time and money, which really is something that most people want to do, uh, it's, it's an excellent, excellent way to, to go through the process. Uh, so the basic framework for arbitration, well, uh, it's, it's very similar to a, to a bench trial. Now, the one difference is, is that uh, sometimes there's an agreement that rather than having one arbitrator, um, there's an agreement to have a panel of arbitrators. So usually it's three. Um, and oftentimes what happens is one side will choose one arbitrator, the other side will choose the other, and then there will be an agreed upon neutral arbitrator, which seems a little uh, strange and sometimes repetitive because it's, you know, if you think about it, if you just really got the neutral or, or really a highly objective uh, arbitrator to start with, you may not need all three. It, I mean, these folks are expensive, so I mean, it's not like they're you know 80 bucks an hour. Um, Well-trained, specialized arbitrators are, are not inexpensive. So if you can work on one, that's good. Uh, I think parties a lot of times feel that if they each have a representative arbitrator, so to speak. Uh, it, it will help their position. I mean, it, it seems that oftentimes each of those people will kind of cancel each other out. And so, you're, again, you're left with the, the neutral objective arbitrator, but that's, you know, that just depends on, on people's preferences. Um, we've talked about the fact that arbitrators you know, have way more expertise normally in substantive areas. Um, Another thing that is extremely important in regards to why arbitration can be valuable uh, and one that can't really be undervalued is, uh, let me take the cons out because this is a significant 
benefit that sometimes people forget. There's a level of confidentiality that you have with an arbitration. Obviously, it can be, it can be private. I mean, it normally is private. Uh, it's not, uh, I mean, you can record it or not, but it's not, uh, there's no public access provided or anything. So for things like medical malpractice matters and other things, uh, even family law matters or, or not, but business types of transactions where you might not want to have things publicly aired, uh, maybe uh, employment disputes, sexual harassment claims, things where you might tend to uh, shy away from having uh, a lot of publicity, arbitration is going to be private and, and very, uh, very different from the publicity that you might get from a trial. Um, I mean, trials can be highly publicized. I mean, they're open to the public. Anybody can walk in, the news, a newspaper reporter or, or anyone. So you have private proceedings with an arbitration and confidentiality that you just are not going to have in a standard litigation. Um, the other benefit that people uh, sometimes don't realize is that there's an informality connected to an arbitration that helps to keep people um, uh, I think more at ease with the process. You don't have, uh, you know, a judge that's elevated at a high level wearing a black robe, and you know people are down here that following this this highly uh, regulated rules and procedure. I mean, there there just is a much greater level of informality. Not that you don't follow rules of evidence, uh, but you can you can keep the proceeding in a much more free-flowing style than you could in any sort of litigation, even a bench trial. Uh, and so uh, you, you can agree that, um, you know, that the rules of evidence will be followed or that there could be less formality in regards to the, to the FRE. Uh, generally, uh, rules of evidence are, are not all that frequently used in arbitrations other than things like legal privilege and so forth. Um, you can do things like you can agree and stipulate ahead of time to allow one side or both sides to use an affidavit in lieu of live testimony or you could do that by saying that you'll agree to do an evidence deposition in lieu of live testimony. Uh, you can have witnesses. Um, generally you find that there are fewer witnesses in uh, an arbitration because there's generally an agreement to kind of try to limit that a little bit by uh, either having depositions or affidavits. Because a lot of times you can, you can, you'll have a witness that may be there to testify about one or two relatively small items. So rather than go through the entire formal process of, of being sworn in, of all these things, if it's really not a matter that's highly disputed by one or, or the other side, then there's no reason not to allow that to come in on an affidavit. And you know, if if if, if it really is, again, it has to be stipulated to at a time. But that's much different than things that you can get um, otherwise. So, uh, other another benefit. So let's let me make sure to mark that here because that is one of our so informality and shorter hearing So, we also have the benefit in arbitration of not just getting to it more quickly, but when you actually have the arbitration hearing, 
most often the hearing itself is going to be much quicker than if you had a formal uh, bench trial or obviously jury trial. So even with a bench trial, uh, there, there's still a lot of formality in the process that you can trim away through, through the arbitration process. And so a case that might take you uh, two to three days to complete if you went through a uh, bench trial scenario. In an arbitration, you might be able to uh, have the entire case heard in three to four hours, essentially half a day. Um, maybe one day, but you're still talking about trimming off two-thirds uh, of the time by utilizing the arbitration system rather than the bench trial system. So that's a pretty significant matter as well, and of course that helps to save money and, and time and cost. So uh, having a much shorter hearing, definitely uh, significant. Now, another area that's uh, you could consider, I guess, in some ways a benefit and potentially uh, a, con, a pro and a con, is that arbitrators are not bound by substantive law issues. Um, arbitrators like mediators are not all attorneys, and so if they're not an attorney, they're not necessarily going to be as informed about substantive uh, law issues. Uh, but they can make decisions, and again, it goes back to how the agreement is drafted to do the arbitration, but they can make decisions based on common practices within a particular industry, um, regardless of what the law says. And now that doesn't have to be that way, but it can be, uh, it, it, I mean, the parties can agree to that uh, if, if they want to for whatever reason. So. Uh, you know, arbitrators tend to want to reach a fair result based on their perception of the facts and the evidence, um, but they really can't be bound to follow the law unless you have a provision in the agreement that specifies how they're going to make a ruling. So. Uh, so that's something that, you know, Something to consider as far as, I'm going to put that out here. Not bound by substantive law. And then finally, this is definitely both a benefit, but it's also something that can be viewed as a, uh, something that's negative about the process. And that is that arbitrations are final and binding. Um, I doubt you'll ever find a, a, uh, an agreement that says that they're anything but final and binding. So the problem with that is, at least in uh, a bench trial or a jury trial or in litigation generally, you always have the uh, opportunity and the uh, alternative to consider an appeal if you felt that something wasn't done correctly or uh, rules of evidence weren't followed appropriately or you know something like that. But with an arbitration, there are very limited grounds to appeal, and I mean very limited, and really it's, it's so infrequent that, I mean, I don't even know that it would rate on a scale. Um, but normally the only time that you're going to be able to set aside an arbitration award is for something like uh, fraud, corruption, bias, but something where you have... Um, there's been a material mistake and you, you have solid evidence to show that there was some sort of fraud or bias involved. Uh, but otherwise, if you don't have that, whatever the uh, decision by the arbitrator is, it is. Uh, 
And so that can be a, a definite, that can go both ways. It can go for you and it can obviously definitely go against you. So that one kind of counts on, on both. But it's something that you need to understand regardless that the decision is final. And they're really outside of some pretty rare circumstances. That's it. There's just nowhere to go with it. Um, so it obviously goes without saying that as we talked about with mediators, when you're looking for an arbitrator, you're looking for an expert, you really want to make sure that you do your due diligence and that you don't make a mistake on that because that uh, can be a particularly brutal situation. So, uh, but at, let's go through one more time. That basically, and some of these can be inter, interwoven with negatives as well, but, but on the pro side, definitely a time saver, definitely is going to save a substantial amount of money over litigation and over going through a, a bench trial or jury trial. Your uh, arbitrator or panel of arbitrators, which would normally be three, if you use a panel, where you have one person chosen from each side and then a neutral. Uh, but, you're, but all these arbitrators are going to be very uh, experienced and have a much greater level of skill and expertise than most judges that you would uh, be involved with in a trial. Uh, the process of the actual arbitration hearing and of course the arbitration process itself is confidential and private and it's something for uh, you know, employment related harassment cases, uh, med mal cases, really almost just about any kind of case you could certainly um, see that where that would be a, a, a very significant benefit. The process is generally way more informal in the sense that there can be an agreement to not use the rules of evidence or that they apply, but it's just less uh, formal than you would see in a, in a bench trial setting. You normally would have uh, the arbitration hearing itself, and it can be in a law school classroom, it can be in a restaurant banquet meeting room, it can be in a hotel room, it can be in a a meeting room almost anywhere it could be in the back of an Arby's. I mean, that's the thing about the informality of arbitration. It can be done anywhere, and you, you don't have people that are sitting above other people. So when we talk about having a, a level playing field, you can see where for both sides people feel comfortable that you know there's there's no advantage for anyone. Very informal process. Uh, you're hearing the actual time of the hearing is normally going to be significantly shorter because it is more informal and you don't have a lot of the same things that you would see in a standard court bench trial. Uh, and so a trial that might, might last two to three days, you can wrap up in, in half a day to a day. Uh, and of course, not be, the arbitrator does not have to be bound by substantive law in a particular area. Uh, but that would be something that, again, would most likely be uh, addressed in an uh, arbitration agreement. And the decision is absolutely final and binding so far or so long as there is not an assertion of fraud, corruption, or bias that was underlying the arbitration and that one side or the other learns of after it's concluded. But just because you don't like the result, just because you think the arbitrator uh, was too tall, too short, too skinny, too fat, too old, too young, uh, whatever you might have thought, whatever, unless it, it really amounts to a material issue involving some sort of fraud, something like that, uh, your ability to change the, the outcome of an arbitration is slim to none. So that's a scary thought especially if you have not really done as, as substantive a job as you should have in terms of identifying an arbitrator uh, and, and done your you know, due diligence in terms of the selection process, 
that can be a very scary place to be. So we're looking at, at eight benefits to arbitration. Uh, and again, some of these things can, can be used on the flip side as negatives potentially. Uh, and, and mostly, you know, that's, I mean, really going to hit hard in, in the question of the finality of an arbitration. Because uh, if you think you have a chance of losing, which every case you do, you just can't appeal it as you could in a, in a bench trial. Um, and, you know, the, the informality and some of these issues about where an arbitrator doesn't have to be bound by substantive law, these can all be downsides and things that you might want to consider. And, of course, the, I, the issues that we talked about earlier in terms of uh, in consumer and employment law, uh, binding arbitrations where there's really no or limited ability, uh, there's really no ability to negotiate for that agreement if you want to buy a phone or a dog toy or almost anything. Um, or in a job setting where you won't get the job if you don't sign saying that you'll agree to waive your right to a jury trial in order to get the um, dispute resolution program coverage. So th those are the downsides. Uh, there, there's certainly probably far more upside to the idea of arbitration, um, especially when you've already used the tools that we've been talking about in terms of solid negotiations and mediation. If those things don't work, uh, this can be a good kind of resting point for resolving your, your case. So um, I think that's a good stopping point for this, and then we'll uh, get into talking a little bit more uh, about the, you know, how arbitration comes to be and what cases it can be used in and, and how do we get, like, how this is all going to work in terms of the mechanics of it.